Hi, this is Walter Weesey with Yellowstone Country Fly Fishing and Parks Fly Shop. And what I'm going to be doing for you this week is a slight variation on a pattern called a delectable bug, which is uh, by Dan Delecta, owner of uh, Beartooth Fly Fishing over in Cameron, Montana, which is on the Madison. And this pattern, uh, not this color, but this, this basic pattern uh, is kind of my number one or 1A one stonefly nymph these days. You know, it's kind of like a Pat's rubber legs, but it's got more going on. And this is sort of representative of a whole family of nymphs. They tie these things with chenille bodies, they tie them with peacock curl bodies, um, all sorts of different colors, some variations in terms of wings and wing cases and beads and things, but this is sort of a slight variation on the most basic version. And the main, the main, you know, the main change I've made here is simply tying it on a jig hook. Um, you know, most of the time these are tied on a standard. Dairiki 285 is what I would use, uh, which is no longer in production, but uh, Komodo makes a version. But they're usually tied on a 3XL uh, heavy wire curved shank nymph hook, which is the same as uh, the fly, the hook I used last week on the on the Clouser nymph. But uh, anyway, this is a uh, very good stonefly nymph, and there's a lot going on here, and so I figured I'd show it to you. And given our current weather, this is something I'm going to be using here very very soon, both in Yellowstone Park and outside of it in Montana. So what I've got here is a, an Eagle Claw number 630 size 6 hook in the vise. And this hook you will definitely need to buy online or from like a bait and tackle uh, shop. It's not a fly tying hook. And the reason I'm using it is because it, as you can see here it's a long shank 90 degree jig hook. Which A, the long shank is what I want for stonefly nymphs and then B, with that 90 degree bend there, I can actually use, you know, you, you can see here I can't even push that bead over the uh, the bend there, but I can tie a jig with a standard uh, bead, a brass bead rather than a tungsten bead. And you might think it's kind of strange to be tying a jig, you know, something I want to get down fast uh, with a brass bead, but I'm also going to put some wire on this. And this is, a, as you can see here, a very big bead, and so no problem getting down. And the bead here is a copper, and you know, I, I have this in my 3 16th inch um, Tic Tac bottle that I use to hold beads, but uh, I think that's actually a little bigger than that. I think that's a metric bead that's a little bigger than 3 16 but it's a big bead. It's about as big as you can get. And my thread's going to be 6-0 black here, and uh, I could also use something like brown or fluorescent orange, but it's going to be hidden anyway. And I'm going to start that, I'm going to be very careful to keep that on the horizontal portion of that hook. And uh, now my legs on this fly, and I've got a total of uh, four legs on this fly, are going to be kind of a brown, um, speckled brown silicone leg, and you could certainly use the, uh, you know, barred spandex, like a, like a sexy floss or something like that as well. So I'm going to take that, and I'm just going to bend those. Um, I like to do a pinch on this sort of thing when I'm tying an antennae, and so I'm going to pinch that, and then just get that as close basically to the front of that as I can and it can be kind of hard to trap that there we go and then just a couple wraps here because I also am going to wrap uh, some dubbing over that now the dubbing that's going to cover up those wraps is going to be pheasant tail ice dub and I'm just going to get a little pinch of that and really this part is kind of optional, uh, particularly if you're tying this on one of the standard hooks, it would be very optional. However, with the uh, with the jig, you know, with the bend of the hook there, I'm a little worried still about that sliding over, and so I want to bulk up that front end of the fly a little bit. Before I do that, however, I'm going to invert that, and I'll show you why. I'm going to get my super glue, and I'm just going to apply some super glue right on the underside on those thread wraps uh, again because I don't want this to move when that bead goes over it and so that super glue is going to A anchor the dubbing in place and then B uh, of course when I'm shoving the bead against it like this it's not going to move and then I'm just going to go ahead and whip finish here immediately behind that ball of dubbing and then like I said I've got the bead and so I've got the legs here ahead of that bead and then I can shove that bead right up and I can shove pretty hard and it's not going to move much. And then the next step here, uh, and realistically I'd probably stage tie to this point, uh, you know I'd do a dozen or so to this point and then maybe go back and then do this step which is to wrap some lead wire on the hook 
And I am using lead here because this fly is mostly going to be for the Boulder River outside of Yellowstone Park, and so it's legal. Um, Boulder is actually, as I produce this video, is dropping really fast. It's probably going to be in shape here, um, you know, possibly even today. I'm, I'm recording this on Monday and uh, releasing the video, of course, at midnight on Wednesday. And uh, it's very possible that the Boulder will be coming into play on Wednesday. Um, certainly Thursday, Friday, Saturday, somewhere in there, needs to be under 2,000 cubic feet per second to be safe to float for me. And it's a great, great nymph river. It uh, enters the Yellowstone east of Livingston. And it's, it's a lot like the Gardner River. If you're familiar with the Gardner River, um, steep, fast, broken pocket water, but of course, since it's outside the park and bigger, you can float it. And uh, it's got mostly like 12 to 14 inch rainbows. You know, that's kind of the dominant fish. But it's got some big browns too, particularly in the lower reaches. You know, I've, I've had clients catch them up into the very high teens, pushing 20 inches. And uh, I've, well, Cody from Parks Fly Shop was floating with me last year, and he hooked when I was probably 24. So if you've fished the Yellowstone, uh, you know, fished the Madison, done kind of the standard stuff, the boulder is super, super cool. And it's floatable for about a month here, so probably no later, I'd say at the absolute latest, the 15th of June, actually, given the cooler temperatures we've got it's going to be floatable for about a month to maybe six weeks depending on moisture and uh, super cool change up upstream but anyway so i went went ahead here and put in my black thread and bound down that lead and made a little thread dam behind it to kind of hold that in place and i never measure my lead but i you know tied it in essentially even with the tip of this hook by the way while i'm talking about the hook um I'm using this thing not because it's a great hook, but because it's got this 90 degree bend on it. Uh, you will need to sharpen these hooks. They're not they're not particularly sharp out of the out of the package. Any, anyhow, um, this fly actually has two tails, and so the first one's going to be brown dyed grizzly chickaboo on the version I'm tying. Now, you know, various colors of marabou, uh, standard marabou usually actually, on the normal versions. Um, in fact, there's one thing I'm going to do first, which is I'm going to put a little ball of hot orange dubbing here. And this is non-standard. Um, I am actually trying to sort of get the effect using a delectable uh, pattern that I would get by using a fly called a stone bomb. Uh, it's a, another stone fly nymph. Much, much more complicated than this. It's a very, very complex fly. A whole lot of steps. Uh, would take me probably 10 to 15 minutes to tie, just tying it. And uh, to buy it, they're twenty-two dollars a dozen guide price, and so that's that's a little extreme. And so I'm trying to get close to that, doing the delectable style. Anyway, I put in that little ball of hot orange dubbing, and then my tail, first tail, is going to be brown grizzly chickaboo here, and you know adjust colors to the size of the fly. It should basically match the uh, whatever the main color of the fly you're tying is. That's what color you should tie the tail in. Now my Second set of tails are going to be um, another one of those brown uh, silicone legs, and again, I'm going to kind of I'm going to take this one, and I'm actually going to go in on the far side of the hook here, and I probably won't get those quite even. I'm going to do one turn there, and if I don't get it quite even, I'm going to pull it there and get it closer to even before I bind that in a little bit tighter, and then I'm going to pull the other half of that over the top of the shank and the reason I did it that way rather than doing it a pinch that I did at the front is you know the, the front of that is going to stay separated no matter what since there's nothing um, you know it's not uh, there's nothing ahead of it and so but in the back here if I did the pinch wrap there's a good chance it would be on top of the hook and you know mixing with that the rest of that tail it would uh, it wouldn't want to stay separated and I do want those to be you know like a stonefly tail out to the sides Okay, now the next step here, I'm going to tie in some brown chenille. And uh, the delectable stone flies, most of them have chenille bodies. Some of them actually use uh, ostrich hurl. I've seen versions that use ice dub. I've seen versions that use peacock hurl. Uh, that's mega prints. Uh, if you've seen that pattern, that's, you know, this is kind of a, a family of flies. And so you can use kind of whatever you want for the body on this thing. Um, most of the time when they're tied with a chenille body, uh, they're tied with a speckled crystal chenille, and so you don't need any sort of a rib because, you know, having a speckled chenille that has uh, little bits of flash and things in it gives you that sort of effect. But since this one's, I'm using solid color chenille, I'm going to tie in some medium copper wire here. 
And I'm going to kind of just wrap that all the way up the shank here, and that's going to uh, A, bind that in really well, and then B, give me a little bit more horizontal bulk in the body to give it that sort of stonefly flattened profile. And then I'm going to finish a little bit more than halfway up the shank, roughly right there. And then I'm going to go ahead and wrap that chenille. Now, if I was just tying a normal chenille bodied uh, delectable, I would just wrap the chenille all the way up the hook. You know, I would, I would do the steps I'm going to be doing here after I tie in the rib. I would do those uh, before I wrap the chenille, and then I would just wrap the chenille most of the way of the eyes. And then I'm going to go ahead and wrap that uh, medium ultra wire in copper, and three to five turns, and I'll wind up also, uh, because obviously that bound down quite a bit of that uh, chenille. I'm going to go ahead and scrape that with my toothbrush to try to free some of those trout fibers. Okay, and then the next step again I'm going to get off two of those silicone legs and tie those in. And like I said, I would have done this before I wrapped the chenille if I was uh, not adding a rib to that abdomen. But same kind of deal, I'm going to do kind of one wrap on the near side and then cross it over. Now, unlike something like a Pat's rubber legs where I would often tie um, you know, the legs in on one side and then go to the other, I don't really want these legs to splay forward. So the, the back pair there, splaying back is fine. The front pair, I don't really want them to splay forward. And so uh, that's kind of why I'm tying them in like this rather than tying two, you know, if I tied just one leg in, like, say, like this, uh, you can kind of see how that wants to go forward like that in the front. I don't want that on this fly. Um, you know, on a Pat's rubber legs where I, do, I don't have another thing at the front of the fly, that's fine, but since I'm going to have hackle on this fly, I kind of don't want that leg to be interfering with the hackle any. So again, I do, you know, one or two wraps there on that far side, then pull it over like so, and get those in, and then I'm going to go ahead and trim those, and then I'm going to get my chenille again. I should have done this actually before I put the legs in, but anyhow, I'm going to come back in here and tie that back in. I could also use a contrasting chenille here. You'll see some versions of this fly that have a flashback. Um, if I was really trying to push the button of that uh, stone bomb I just mentioned, I would actually be uh, tying in a, a wing case on the underside of the fly here with some epoxy over the top of it. Um, but uh, on this one I'm just going to do chenille. And most of them uh, just use chenille. I'm going to go ahead and wrap the, uh, the thorax of that fly. And I am trying to wrap that a little bit thicker than the abdomen. That's why I'm, it's kind of slipping off of itself there. And you want to make sure to make at least you know one wrap in front of the rubber legs right there. Um, just to, again, kind of push those back a little bit. And this is one place where, you know, I may have uh, switched to a contrasting color of thread or something like that. Because you do generally wind up building a pretty heavy thread collar. And so if you want a hot spot, I could have switched to fire orange thread or chartreuse thread or something like that here. But I do have one more step here, which is to tie in the hackle. And here I'm actually using a uh, brown dyed grizzly hen saddle. But any soft, you know, webby, long fibered hackle would be fine. And uh, as with the rest of this fly, you could you could trade trade up the uh, colors however you like. I'd say probably the most common color is going to be black, but you know there's versions that use brown, there's versions that use tan, there's versions that use purple even, and uh, the Mega Prince, which is pretty similar to this, uses I think a partridge uh, feather. I'm going to do two, maybe three. You know you can do as many turns as you want. Two to three. I think I did three there. Um, three turns of that, and as you can see, the way I tied in the legs, just a little bit behind the uh, the hackle, 
they don't interfere with each other. You can see there, you're going to get movement out of all of that. If the, uh, the legs were angled forward, they would kind of tangle in the hackle and maybe not move as much. But anyway, I'm going to come in here now and just whip finish. And since this is kind of a busy fly, I'm going to do a second whip finish. I'm not too worried about the uh, thread build up there. And then for my super glue or for my head cement here, again, because everything is pretty busy at the front of the fly, I'm going to actually go all around that with my super glue. And I could use, you know, some UV cure there if I wanted as well. But there you have it. That's a uh, kind of a variation on the delectable bug, Stonefly Nymph. And uh, like I said, I expect to be using this here in a week or so on the Boulder River. And uh, if it works, I'll tie some with um, lead free wire to use in Yellowstone Park, particularly on the Gardener. Uh, still looking for trips this, this summer, and I'd certainly like to hear from anyone who's looking to fish in the Yellowstone region. Uh, getting a few trips coming in now, finally, but it's certainly a lot thinner than usual, and I've got, you know, I've got some weeks where I have five days booked, but I don't have any weeks where I'm booked out, and there's a lot of weeks where I'm fairly thin. As always, thanks for watching, and I will see you next week.